And so, Amanda, welcome. Thank you, Scott, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. So, um, Amanda Keith is um, she's a reverse mortgage specialist with Mutual of Omaha. And Amanda, why don't you tell us a little bit more about your background and um, you know where you come from, what you do now, and uh, get let people get to know you just a little bit. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, I moved here from Texas six years ago, and now I live in Oakland. I'm experienced as a CPA. I was in the audit practice at PricewaterhouseCoopers, and then I was at PepsiCo and a controller down in Texas. And then when I moved here, I changed careers. I am an expert in problem solving, and my sister is also in this reverse mortgage business, and she thought I would be an excellent fit for the business. And I like solving problems around real estate and trust issues, and um, I'm very consultative in my role as a reverse mortgage specialist. Like I said, I'm local, I'm easy to reach, and um, my company has great rates. And I do specialize in these loans. I only do reverse mortgages. I've also been a guest lecturer at um, UC Berkeley Extension, their uh, Merritt College's real estate finance class. I've spoken to Cal CPA groups, a number of real estate groups, fiduciaries, and I love helping retirees enjoy their golden years. This is something they've long awaited and uh, their home is the, usually the largest asset they have. For the average American, the home is 70% of their net worth. So I help them tap that equity to have a a more pleasurable retirement with more peace of mind. That's what we all want, right? We want more money to be able to spend in retirement, manage our money correctly. And in a lot of cases, for a lot of people on the call right now, they may be considering making a move out of state. So we're going to kind of talk about, you know, some scenarios uh, looking at that. And um, so give us kind of a background. I know there's a lot of misconceptions about reverse mortgages. And I know that you're going to address that a little bit. Tell us just in a nutshell, what is a reverse mortgage? And you also have the acronym HECM. Sounds like I'm clearing my throat, but that's H-E-C-M. Tell us a little bit about um, what that is. So a HECM is the acronym for a home equity conversion mortgage. This is a federally insured loan with deferred repayment. There are many uses for this loan. And today we're going to focus mainly on the HECM for purchase, like you mentioned. So imagine if you could buy a house never make a monthly mortgage payment. The FHA, the Federal Housing Administration, would guarantee that you get to live in that house for the rest of your life without ever making a monthly mortgage payment up to, 100, up to age 150, by the way. In case any of you plan to live that long, you will be protected to stay in the house. All future appreciation goes to your heirs. So that's a huge misconception about these loans. Your heirs would inherit the property subject to the debt, or you can sell it at any time, and you have the right to sell or move anytime if you want to. So this is a home equity conversion mortgage for purchase, and you might be saying, what's the catch? So the catch is that you'll need a about 50% down payment money, which you would receive from the sale of your current property. So like Scott mentioned, this, a lot of people are using this to downsize outside of the Bay Area. So sell your home here, and then purchase your next home with a HECM for purchase loan. So Amanda, how does the qualifying work? Because I know that there's certain guidelines that you have to meet. So give us kind of an overview of what that looks like. Yeah, so you would need to use this loan on a primary residence. You do need to be 62 or over. So at least one of the people on title needs to be 62 or over. And you'll need about half down for the down payment. There are minimal income and credit requirements. So we need to see that borrowers have money to pay their property taxes and homeowners insurance, have money to maintain the property. And like I said, they'll need to be saying they're going to live in the property as their primary residence. Uh, this is available on single family homes, one to four unit properties, condos and townhomes. So sometimes people wanna move and buy a duplex or a triplex so they can buy that property with a reverse mortgage. So they would never have a monthly mortgage payment and they would have income coming in from those other units. So that's they also- rent those units out. Okay, got it. How about, how about like price restrictions? So, you know, let's say somebody's gonna be on the lower end, maybe 250, $300,000. Obviously that's not here in the Bay Area. But what if they're going up to maybe eight or $900,000 some, somewhere else? There are no minimums on this loan. Um, they can buy as, as as inexpensive of a home as they want to. 
and I can loan up to $3 million. So I offer both the federally insured HECM reverse mortgage for purchase loan, and I offer a jumbo reverse mortgage loan for which I can loan up to about $3 million. So that would be more based on that specific scenario, and I would be happy to talk with you, any, any of you, about those specifics. Okay. And just a reminder to our participants, once again, thanks for being on the program today. If you have any questions for Amanda, we want to, we're happy to answer those. You can type those into the Q&A box. You should see a Q&A box. Um, and there's also a chat box, which allows you to um, ask any questions that you have. So Amanda, tell us more about kind of, you know, let's say, for example, if this is something that I'm interested in looking at, um, what does that process look like? What are the steps involved in um, obviously having a consultation with you to find out if this is a good fit for me, but then beyond that, as far as applying for the loan itself. Right, thanks for asking. So if you're looking to use a HECM for Pro, I would suggest starting the process at least three to four weeks before you're planning to make an offer on any home. And like Scott said, you would first meet with me and your agent and yourself, so it would be the three of us, to talk about the program, the process, and the requirements for the loan. Then you would submit your financial documents to me and I would send you a list. So you would send me the items on that list so that I can get you a strong pre-approval letter. So just like a traditional mortgage, we do offer strong pre-approval letters requiring obviously that you have that approximate 50% down payment and that would be based on your age. Mm -hmm. The amount of down payment is based on age. So the older you are, might be less than 50% down that you would need to put. It might be closer to 40% down payment. We use 50 as a general rule of thumb. Then after you send those documents to me and I get you a pre-approval letter, you would move forward with a HUD, the Department of Housing and Urban Development insures these loans, a HUD counseling session. And that takes about an hour and the, that counselor explains to you how the loan works they tell you again everything that I've told you to make sure that you understand it. And that counseling is done by a third party. So this is an extra protection that's in place for the borrowers to make sure they understand the loan. Right. Then after you complete that counseling session, one week later, I can take your application. Um, so, and then you can, present your, you can present your offer and I'll submit your application. And we do close in 25 to 30 days. We are the number one reverse mortgage purchase lender in the United States. Uh, so yeah, it's a fast process. Just make sure you get pre-approved first and it will all go really quickly about the same length of time as a regular loan. Yeah, it sounds like it's very similar to a traditional mortgage. And even like you mentioned, you're, you, even though you're putting down, let's say 40 to 50% or so of a down payment, you don't have any mortgage payments, you're still qualifying, like you said, for the property taxes, the insurance, maybe even the homeowners association dues. If there is, is a homeowners right? association, yes, okay. you need to qualify. So you have to make sure you qualify for those. And, and that's a fast turnaround time to be able to, like you said, be able to close in three to four weeks. And, and really the only difference is the consultation that you're required to have with a representative from HUD. So that is unique in the reverse mortgage qualification that's not found in traditional mortgage, correct? Exactly. Yep. So pre-approval counseling application. Exactly. Okay. Excellent. Yeah, so, yeah. Start looking, start talking to me three to four weeks before you want to make an offer. And then okay. once you make your offer, we can close you within 25 to 30 days. Now we have a question from Lisa here. Can you purchase a property out of state? So let's take that in two parts. Are there any regulations on where people can use these? And the second part of this, Amanda, is um, are there any restrictions that you have to be able to service your clients who are looking to do something outside of California? So as far as regulations on properties, uh, if you're looking to use the HECM for a condo, the condo would need to be HUD approved. As far as location specifics, Mutual of Omaha is licensed to do these loans in 48 states. We do not offer these loans in West Virginia or New York. There might be other lenders that offer them in those states. I'm not sure. Uh, but yes, I can help you almost anywhere you decide to go. Okay, fantastic. Lisa, thanks for the question. Um, okay, so we've talked a little bit about, uh, you know, what, what the process is. Let's talk um, about kind of, my, and we talked about this about a week ago. My question is what kind of regulations have been put into place to make sure the homeowners get the right mortgage? Now we talked about the HUD consultation because there's obviously, you know, there's been a lot of misconceptions and misunderstandings about, you know, how it works and how, you know, people are protected. 
And I think you had mentioned that at some point, you know, several years back, there were some changes. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, let me actually go back a little bit before that. In the 1980s, a loan called a reverse annuity mortgage was offered by insurance companies. So that's oftentimes confused with the current day reverse mortgage. So reverse annuity mortgages were offered at very high interest rates, such as 14% interest. With that money, you were required to buy an annuity. And then when the borrower passed away or moved out of the home, the insurance company also got half the appreciation from the home. So those loans are no longer available. Um, the Heckam product was introduced in the late 80s and it became available to use for purchases during the 90s. Um, even then there were some issues with reverse mortgages since there did not used to be a financial assessment process required for borrowers. Uh, people were getting into these loans that actually could not afford to pay their property taxes and homeowners insurance and maintain the property. And those are requirements of the loan. So if you don't pay your taxes and property charges, you're in default and those sure. people were getting foreclosed on. So in 2015, HUD implemented a few changes. One of those is that financial assessment is now required for all borrowers. So we make sure that people have the willingness and capacity to pay their property charges and maintain the property. A second requirement is that if people have a history of being late paying their property taxes or homeowners insurance on their current home, then we would set aside a portion of the reverse mortgage loan proceeds in what's called a life expectancy set aside bucket. It's a sort of escrow account. And then the loan servicer would pay their property charges and, um, and uh, they would pay their property taxes and homeowners insurance on the borrower's behalf for the remainder of their life expectancy. So that is a huge protection that's been put in place. Uh, there's also now protection for a non-borrowing spouse. So let's say that um, there are two people purchasing the property. Uh, one of them is 62 and one of them's not yet 62. Now there is protection for that younger person so that even if the older person passes away first, the younger person is still protected to remain in the home the rest of their lives without ever making any monthly mortgage payments to the debt. So all repayment continues to be deferred until the rest of that person's life. So those are huge changes that were implemented in 2015 by HUD and they have completely changed the landscape as to the protections for borrowers. Yeah, that's great. And a lot of that is really just kind of make sense, common sense lending practices, right? That are following what has already been done in traditional lending. And you mentioned, you know, similar to uh, the escrow impound account that, you know, people, a lot of times they'll elect to say, I would rather just, you know, set of setting aside money for property taxes and insurance and paying that on my own. I'll just pay that with my mortgage. Can people elect to have that type of an account set up? Or you is can that, absolutely you can elect, elect to do that on a reverse wish. mortgage. Yes, yes. And I do suggest, especially for more elderly borrowers, um, you know, that way they never have to think about paying their property taxes and homeowners insurance. So it, okay. it is a safeguard to protect. Absolutely. Borrowers. Yeah. Um, we've got a few questions here. So I'll start off with a couple of these. Brad asks, how do the costs of the reverse mortgage compare to a bridge loan? I'm going to assume he's talking to maybe closing costs and, and fees and things like that. Um, so how about that, Amanda? Yeah. So closing costs on these loans, the, the largest of the closing costs of the total closing cost is the HUD, it's called mortgage insurance premium. And that is about 2% of the home value up to a, a, a certain limit. It can't go higher than 15,000. So that would come out of the initial proceeds. There are also the, there's also the lender's origination fee and the closing costs um, that go to third parties like the title and escrow companies. Depending on the rate on the loan, very similar to forward mortgages, if you're willing to take a higher rate, we can provide lender credit to cover some of those upfront costs. Mm -hmm. So um, there are the, the origination fees and the closing costs definitely range from zero up to 20,000, depending if you want the lowest rate and we're not able to offer any lender credit. So, um, but that would be a specific scenario. So yeah, you can really worth, customize that, right? Yeah, to based really off of what, it. yeah. And as far as the bridge loans, those are typically much higher interest. I have uh, variable rate loans starting in the high twos. I have fixed rates starting in the um, 3.8% 3 .8, 3 .8 fixed rate loans. 
So, and again, it just, we have all different kinds of loan options and rates. So it just depends on what you're looking for, what kind of loan to value you need, what your age is, things like that. Okay. So I'm happy to speak to you specifically about your scenario. And typically on bridge loans, you're going to be paying high points on that and a high interest rate because it's a short term loan. So they, you know, the, the bank's got to make money short term on the origination fees because there's not a longevity of payments that's happening because it's really the purpose is to, you know, for a short term from this property to that property. Right. And remember um, with bridge loan, you're also making monthly payments, whereas with the reverse mortgage, you're not. Great point. Okay. Uh, Colin asked, should you have your Bay Area house on the market before looking to buy elsewhere to know how much money you have available? Um, I, I can answer that. So really doing an assessment um, with our team and also with Amanda to find out how much equity you have in the property and being able to determine how much do you need to spend? Um, you know, what can you extract from the property, from the equity to be able to put in that helps to determine you know, uh, what you're going to put down on your new property, what that monthly mortgage amount is going to look like, what those monthly mortgage payments are going to look like. You don't necessarily have to, and this is where everybody's situation is going to be very, very unique because some people may have to have, you know, the, the money from their property to, you know, to push over to, the, you know, utilize for the next property. Um, so that's really, you know, kind of a case by case basis call. And I'm happy to have that conversation with you, you know, offline as well. Uh, somebody else asked, is the reverse mortgage for the original primary property, the new property, or both? It's for the property that you're planning to live in in the future. So you'll be selling, if you're looking to downsize, you would sell your current residence, and then you would use the reverse mortgage on your forever home, is what we call it. The home okay, that you want to age in place in. Yeah, and one more thing, Scott, um, if you're looking to sell, I would definitely always suggest you speak to the tax advisor about what, how much your capital gains would be. Um, mm -hmm. People ask me that question all the time, and it's definitely something to talk to your tax advisor, your CPA, your enrolled agent about. Absolutely. And we'll even throw a financial planner into that bucket, right, to kind of yeah. see what the best way to structure. A lot of people are selling their property. They've got a lot of equity. There might be, you know, tax consequence tied into that, so there can be an investment strategy. Uh, to minimize, you know, the taxes. Uh, and then we have one more uh, question here from Ron. I think I missed something up front. Can you please go back over how the RM is used to purchase another home if you already have a home? Um, so the reverse mortgage needs to be used on what you plan on being your primary residence. And it, re the reverse mortgage requires approximately a 50% down payment and then the loan covers the rest of the, the purchase price and the reverse mortgage does not have any monthly mortgage payments. So you pay half, the reverse mortgage pays half, the reverse mortgage doesn't require any monthly mortgage payments. You need to have be 62 or over and plan to live in the home. Perfect, thanks Amanda. Um, one more question that I know you asked some awesome slides we're gonna get into, so but I wanna just catch this last question here. Uh, I think I heard you say that your heirs would inherit something. Was that the reverse mortgage property? What if you don't have any heirs to think about? Um, your heirs would inherit the property subject to the reverse mortgage debt. So normally they would either sell the property to pay off the reverse mortgage and they would keep the equity or they could refinance the debt and keep the property. If you don't have any heirs, then um, the estate would go through probate, I believe and uh, the state would get the equity in your property. So someone's going to inherit the property, whether it's someone that you've specified or whether it's the state. And, and this is really where it's important to have an estate plan in place, right? You, you have your trust, you have you know, your, your beneficiaries of where, not just your home, but all of your assets and you know, everything else, make sure that you have that in place. And for anybody on this call that does not have an estate plan, they're not expensive. Don't do the ones online, but they're, in my opinion, they're very, very well worth the cost so you can avoid uh, probate, you know, which in California can just be an absolute nightmare, not to mention extremely expensive. Um, so uh, why don't, I know we've got a couple more questions. I'm gonna table those for now um, because I have a feeling that some of what you're gonna talk about now, Amanda, might answer some of these questions. Sure. So I know that you have some examples. You've got a couple of slides that you can show us that maybe visually will help put this better into perspective of how the numbers look 
how you put this into play, right? Let's get into Absolutely. the good stuff. Sure thing. Oh, and um, on that last question as well. Um, oh, well, sorry, we'll come back to that. Okay, we've got the, tell me, okay, great. Yep. This, is a, this, is, this is a matrix. Oh, I, I was gonna say on that last question, even if you don't know who you want to leave your property to, you can leave it to your favorite nonprofit. So it doesn't, it doesn't have to go to an heir. It can go to anyone or any organization you choose. Okay, so back to this Heckam for Purchase matrix. So this just gives an example of, let's say you're 70 years old and are looking to purchase a property for 350. This gives you an idea of what your down payment would be. In that scenario, you'd need to bring a down payment of 170. And you can see the older you get, the less money you would need to bring to closing. And that's just the way these reverse mortgages work. I can loan you more uh, the older you are. So I'm going to move on from that slide. You can always reach, reach out to me and I can send that to you. Okay, here we've got a scenario of, uh, this was a client I helped and they wanted to sell their house here in the Bay Area and buy a property in Las Vegas. So we, they, they, they uh, worked with their realtor to complete step one. I was not involved in step one. That's just the sale of their existing home. So they sold for 1.2 million. They had a mortgage of 450,000, which was a very difficult mortgage payment for them to keep making in retirement. So when they sold, that mortgage was paid off. They paid the real estate commission out of the sale proceeds of about 72,000. There are capital gains to consider. I put a question mark here because they're different for every person. So um, depending on the capital gain, assuming no capital gains, this person had net cash left over of 678. And then that's when I come into the process, get them, got them pre-approved, um, got them counseled. So step two, purchase a new home. These people were 65 and 67. So again, Las Vegas, they found a house for 450. Based on those ages, I was able to loan them exactly half. So I loaned them 225. Again, no monthly mortgage payments on that loan. They paid 225 from their cash on hand of 678. So that means that they had cash left over after their purchase to save or invest of $453,000 and they never had to make another monthly mortgage payment. So how did this change their lives? The result was, they had 413, you know, I, I said 453 before, but they spent $40,000 on a motor home because they wanted to be able to escape Las Vegas when it was hot in the summer and go see friends and family here on the West Coast. So they put 413 into their investment portfolio and they're going to draw from that at about 4% a year, which means that will provide 1376 a month in income. And they got rid of that big mortgage payment that they were really struggling to make after retirement. So that mortgage payment was $2,253 a month. So now they have 30, a little over $3,600 a month in increased cash flow during their retirement years to enjoy their life the way they want to. So that's one example. Uh, we've got another one here. This person sold for $1.2 million and she actually is a widow. Her husband had recently passed away. And she wanted to move to Texas to be closer to her family and have a nice house by the lake so that they could all come over and play. Um, so she sold her house in the Bay Area for 1.2. She also had a mortgage of 400,000. Uh, she paid the real estate commission. And then she had recently received a, step, a partial step up in basis since her husband had passed away. So that's why I'm saying every situation is different with capital gains. Um, and then after she sold her property, we helped her buy a new home in Texas for 525. At 75 years old, I was able to loan her more than 50%. So the Heckam proceeds paid 291 for the purchase. She paid 234 out of her cash from the sale of her property. And that means she had $494,000 left over to save or invest. And she never has to make a monthly mortgage payment again. So similar outcome, she put about five, almost $500,000 into her investment portfolio and she's receiving income from that. I don't know that how, I think she's drawing less than 4%, but the typical, a lot of financial advisors suggest 4%. So that's why I use that rate on these examples. Um, and then her estimated monthly payment went away of 23.50 a month. So she's got positive cash flow to show 
after this transaction of about $39.96 per month. Um, I have another example. Do you want me to do that one now or wait? Uh, real quick, I want to get through a couple questions that pertain to those examples. So uh, Don asks, are all of the reverse mortgages based on a 50% down payment? And I think you mentioned, no, not necessarily to sliding scale, correct? It is. It's always between 40 and 60, depending on your age. So you have to be 62 to get the loan. And at 62, um, uh, you might need to put down 55%. But General rule of thumb, it's 50, about 50. So it's always between okay. 40 and 60, yeah. And then Dean asks, what are the restrictions, if any, on modifications to the home? Can you go in, can you get it, can you do additions? What can you do to the home? We need to do the loan while the home is not under construction. So you can, what I would suggest is move in and get the loan and then you can do the construction on the home. We don't have any specific restrictions as long as you're improving the property. Um, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't control what you do to the home. Right. So let's say after the sale, I've bought the property, I've moved in, just like a traditional mortgage. I mean, I own the property. As long as I'm, you know, getting permits and everything I'm supposed to be doing, I can do anything yeah. I want to the home. Correct. Exactly. Yes. yes. Okay. Perfect. Make it as beautiful as you like. Yes. Uh, Ron has a very good question here. So if you were to sell and you already have the equity, let's say you've got a good amount of equity in the property and you don't have to pay capital gains, why would you need a reverse mortgage? So there are three options to buy a house. You've got the pay all cash option. You've got the get a 15 or 30 year mortgage option and you've got the reverse mortgage option. So pay all cash, that means you have less money, less liquidity to retire on because you're spending all that money on the purchase price. Get a mortgage, that means you're putting 20% down and making a monthly mortgage payment for what might, with a 30 year mortgage, might be the rest of your life. So that's cash that's flowing out every month on that mortgage payment. And then the third option, you only put half down. So if you're planning to pay all cash or have a monthly mortgage payment, you can look at the numbers. Do you need that money? Would you rather have that money available to you to spend on yeah. things like long-term care expenses or travel or golfing or, you know, home improvements? Or would you, um, if you don't, if you don't need the money, then this might not be the option for you. You know, if you have lots of, lots of cash flow. Yeah. yeah and, and you mentioned earlier, I mean, your background is as a CPA and a controller, but that, that's really part of the planning process, right? Cause you have to look at your total financial picture and say, okay, if I have $400,000 cash, sure, I can go buy a property, you know, cash and not have to, you know, have any type of mortgage. But looking at it, are you making yourself cash poor, right? So exactly. it's, it's really looking at, you know, talking to your CPA, talking to your financial planner. And this is, and we always recommend this, this is part of our 12, 12 steps, uh, you know, relocation roadmap. It's knowing up front what that's going to look like and what the best structure is for how you're going to allocate the money that's coming out of the property that you're selling and, and where to put it. So talk to your CPA, talk to your financial planner. Absolutely. A um, couple more questions and then we'll get back to your slides here. Uh, perhaps I missed it, but when I pass, what of the new equity remains and would go to my heirs? So the, the money that you borrow from the reverse mortgage is accruing interest every year. So let's say it's accruing interest at 4%. So that loan balance is going up at 4% a year. The home value, on the other hand, is also appreciating at the same time. So your home value is rising over time. So when you pass away or move out, you will need to repay the money that you borrowed plus the interest that accrued. So the house can be sold for market value. So that would include any appreciation that's occurred during the term of the loan. Sell it for market value, pay off the loan plus the interest, and you or your heirs keep the equity. And really the, the way that this is structured, I mean, the reason that we're doing, you said, you know, 40 to 60% loan to value or 50% loan to value is a standard base right. is to make sure if there's any fluctuations in the market or if the mortgage is held for a long period of time, there's still an exit strategy to be able to sell the home with some sort of equity in the property, right? So it's safeguarding the borrower slash homeowner to make sure that they're in a position. Our, our next question, I think, revolves around that. What happens when the time comes when you need to enter assisted living? Can you explain about the selling process and whether there would be enough money to pay for assisted living? 
So, you know, again, it, what's, what does their financial situation look like at that time of selling the property and entering into, you know, some sort of facility? Yeah. And on, based on your specific scenario, I can run an amortization schedule. But again, if you want to enter assisted living, you could sell the property, pay off the loan plus the interest that's accrued, and you would have the equity to pay for your assisted living. Let's say that you uh, broke your hip or, you know, a borrower broke their hip while they were living in the home and they needed to go into skilled nursing or rehab for a while, um, but they didn't plan on leaving the house, they plan on coming back. So it's not until you're out of the home in skilled nursing for 12 consecutive months that the loan becomes due. And then once that loan becomes due, the, um, they have up to six months to figure out how to repay the debt, sell the house, refinance, the, they, they or their heirs could refinance the debt, so there is definitely a process in place to give re a reasonable amount of time to get that debt paid off. That's great information. And, and everybody, thanks so much. These are wonderful questions. Very, very good. And I think as people are asking questions, you know, it's, it's stirring up other ideas. Absolutely. Um, Amanda, I know that you had another slide. So uh, if you'd like, let's go ahead and pull that back up. Uh, uh, and by the way, for... I was just going to mention, by the way, for people who are kind of popping on late, we'll have a recorded version of this available if you happen to miss some of the beginning of it. I just wanted to make sure everybody on the call knows um, a reverse mortgage can be used for things other than purchasing a home. For instance, if you live in a home that you're looking to age in place in. Um, oh, here we go. This is, a, this is an example of a client I'm helping right now. They live down in San Jose. They're 83 and 76 years old, and the husband has dementia. So they do have savings. They have about 370,000 in liquid assets, but the amount of in-home care that, that he's needing need, requires that they have more money than that in total. So they're tapping into the equity so that they can, so you can see here, it's a single family home. The value is about 899. Uh, they currently have liens of 151,000, so they're making a mortgage payment right now of 860 a month. And again, the other liquid assets of 370. Their son is uh, the person that referred me. I work with a lot of financial advisors, and their goal is to age in place. They want to stay in their home, just like many people do. So the solution is that I can help them obtain a reverse mortgage. Uh, total proceeds based on that $900,000 home value are, are 470. And with that money, we're going to first pay off their current mortgage of 151. So that is a requirement. We would first pay off any existing liens because we need to be the first place lien holder. So that in and of itself is eliminating that monthly mortgage payment they're making, principal and interest of 860 a month. And they are able to receive 2880 a month for the next 10 years from the reverse mortgage line of credit. So that's gonna help supplement the the money that they're taking from their retirement portfolio so that they have enough money to pay that in-home caregiver every month. And again, all repayment is deferred until the last borrower moves out or passes away. And that's the case with all reverse mortgages. They're always repayment deferred until the last borrower moves out or passes away. Just wanted to go over with that, that with you real quick. We also use them to help settle divorce cases or inheritance. As long as the borrower is 62 and over, they can pull cash, they can pull equity out of the house, pay someone else off. Certainly a lot of uses and options for this type of a product. Um, and so one question that kind of uh, goes with what you just mentioned there. So after selling a property, we need to pay off the loan and the equity accrued. Would we need to pay you 100% of the equity accrued? So I, I think maybe what the question is, there's going to be, let's see, there's an increase in equity in the property. It goes up in value. Your mortgage balance is also going up in value. But whatever, you know, that, that delta is between those two, when you sell a property, obviously you're going to have your closing costs, but that's what you take with you. So you Correct. do keep the equity. The bank yep. does not keep the equity. But okay. as, as your mortgage is increasing a little bit each month, then obviously your loan balance increases. Correct. So hopefully that answers uh, the, that question. Um, Dean asks, can the new home be placed in a trust? Absolutely. We're very trust friendly. We can close within a trust um, in my industry. It's not like traditional mortgages where sometimes they have to take it out of the trust and then put it back in. We can actually close in a trust. 
Um, and yeah, I'd be happy to review the trust and make sure we don't see any issues. As long as the borrower has the right to encumber the property, then we can do that. And that's a really good point, Amanda, because you know, in the traditional sales model of real estate, you can't close in the trust. So you have to close it with the individual borrowers, then you have to grant deed it back into the trust. So it's an extra step and it's a little bit extra money, but you guys are able to close within the trust. So that that's saves right. an extra step. And then obviously, you know, quite a bit of uh, extra fees. Yeah, in the um, traditional sense, I've heard of people forgetting to put it back in the trust before, and that gets messy. Oh yeah, <laughs> absolutely. That happens quite a bit. Um, so you talked about, uh, you talked a little bit about there's different scenarios using it for, you know, for divorce situations. Somebody can buy out, um, you know, their spouse, right? And, you know, and, and so give us kind of just a, a real brief overview scenario. What would that look like? Yeah, so Luke and Laura got divorced and they owned a property that was worth about 700,000 and Laura wanted to keep the property. They happened to not have a mortgage on it, which made it much cleaner. Um, so Laura stayed in, stayed in the home and she pulled out 350 with a reverse mortgage. So I got her a loan so that she could borrow 350 from the property. She gave that money to Luke and Luke was able to take his 350 in equity and combine that with a Heckam for purchase so that he could buy his own property. And the reason that this is so great, it's almost like they got to take a knife and cut their, their married marriage house in half. So they literally each got half the equity. So now Luke and Laura, she stayed in the family home. He was able to buy his own house with half down and neither one of them are having to rent because you know sometimes when there's a divorce one person might get the house and one person might get most of the money so then one person is you know doesn't have much money to live on and one person doesn't have a house they're usually renting or figuring out how they're going to buy their own house so in this scenario both of them are now homeowners uh, laura got to keep the prop 13. they didn't pay any real estate commission because they didn't need to sell the, the family house the biggest part of this, um, well, one of the biggest parts is that they didn't have to pay capital gains on the property because she got to keep the family home. Without the reverse mortgage, they would have had to sell that house to divide the equity because she didn't have the money to pay him. So but the fact that she was able to pull the money out with the reverse mortgage and pay him, now they're both property owners and neither one of them is making a monthly mortgage payment. So if you have more questions about that, I'm happy to walk you through it yeah. more slowly and with pictures. I didn't put, bring a slide for that. Yeah, one. no, that's fine. That, that goes a little bit deeper. But um, so uh, a clarification question. And Amanda, I'm going to let you take a, a shot at this. While we pay off the increase in the mortgage and interest, can we keep the remaining amount of increase in equity in the property? Uh, yes. So I, I think, I think, you're asking about when you sell, if you get to um, benefit from the appreciation that occurred. And I yes, so. yes, you do. When you sell the property, you would sell it for market value. So if that house is appreciated during your, your, your retirement years, if it's appreciated from 600 to 900, then you're gonna sell it for 900. And maybe I loaned you 300 back, you know, when you got the reverse mortgage, and maybe that 300 has grown to four or 500. So you would sell for nine, pay off the loan balance of four or five, and you would keep the equity. So yes, you get to benefit from any appreciation. So I think that the main difference here is if you look at a traditional mortgage, you're paying the mortgage down every month, but we hope usually your, your equity is going up over time. Right. So you get to keep the difference, but you're paying your mortgage amount down. In this case, the only difference, the equity is still going up, but your principal balance is still going up. You still keep that difference. That's correct. And in the meantime, you're keeping cash in your pocket. So you're keeping your liquidity and you're letting the house take hold the debt. That's right. Okay, perfect. Thank you again for that question. Um, Amanda, what did, what did we not cover here? Uh, a few myths and misconceptions. So, yes, let's um, talk about that. So I hear things all the time, you know, my neighbor told me not to do reverse mortgage because the bank takes your home. So that's not true. Like I mentioned, the borrower has their, they, they get to keep their name on title and they have the right to sell the house or move at any time. They can also refinance at any time, or if you inherit money, you can pay the reverse mortgage off at any time. There are no prepayment penalties. 
and the heirs do inherit the house subject to the debt if you live in the house the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. um, the, the old mortgages I talked about in the 80s, the reverse annuity mortgages, they had the high interest, the annuity uh, requirement, and the appreciation share. Current reverse mortgages have, like I mentioned, pretty low interest, a little higher than traditional mortgages, but like I said, we have loans starting in the high twos and threes. Um, we don't have any annuity purchase requirement. There's no appreciation share. You get to keep all the appreciation in your home subject to whatever you owe. And uh, lots of myths that these loans are inflexible and they are not inflexible. If you get a loan and decide to age in place and get a line of credit, there are lots of different ways you can access that money. It's available for the rest of your life and that money can never be reduced, canceled, or frozen. These are loans that were specifically made for people 62 and over to be able to use the equity in their home and have more money in their pocket. Oh, and one more thing I wanted to mention is that these loans are all non-recourse. Non-recourse means that there's no liability for the borrower to repay the debt. Only the house is liable to repay the debt. So people ask me all the time, well, you know, in 2008, home values crashed. And what if, you know, I had passed away in 2008 and my home value was down and I owed more than the house was worth. If that happens, the reason HUD charges for the mortgage insurance premium I mentioned earlier is because they will cover any deficiency if that ever happened. There's no personal liability for the borrower or for their heirs when they move out if they happen to owe more than the house is worth. So. Okay, excellent. Uh, Jerry asks, what is the rate and the term? Well, rates vary depending on what you're looking for. I have variable rates starting at about in the high twos, and I have fixed rates starting at 3.81. Um, it depends how much debt you have, how much money you need from us, but sometimes higher loan to values. If you need more money than what the traditional reverse mortgage offers, then we could get you a higher loan to value with a higher rate. So I would suggest reaching out to me. I'll need to know your home value or what, so it depends if you're aging in place. Uh, but either way, I need to know the home value or the purchase price, and I need to know your ages. If you're planning to age in place, I also need to know how much you currently owe on the property. Okay, it's really a customized solution, right? Yes. So there, there's yeah. so many different ways to put it together, but yeah. you have to look at the big picture and all the, all yeah. the components of it. Yeah, and um, I, 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 I consult for free on these, on these loans. I don't charge you out of my pocket. My lender pays me if the loan happens, so I'm happy to answer questions. That's great. Okay, so Dean has a question. Now, Amanda, I know you can't give tax advice, but I know that you might have an inclination on this since your background <laughs> is tax. Dean asks, are closing cost points deductible like in a regular mortgage? So the reverse mortgage proceeds cover the closing costs on this loan. So the, there are only two out-of-pocket costs. One is that HUD counseling session I mentioned, which is about $150. The other is the, um, the appraisal deposit, which is about $300. So as far as points on closing costs, you're not, we don't expect you to pay any of that up front. If you did pay it, you would need to talk to your tax advisor on whether you could deduct it. You could pay the closing cost out of pocket if you wanted to. Um, another thing, some people say, well, you know, what if I want to make a payment every year to the reverse mortgage to, to keep the balance lower? So if you're making payments, those payments would be applied first towards the mortgage insurance premium that goes to HUD, then to the interest, and then to the principal. So just like any other loan, if you're paying interest, then you would receive a 1098 form at the end of the year so that you can deduct that interest. Most reverse mortgage borrowers don't want to make any payments, so mm -hmm. they don't have any interest to deduct. I hope that answers your question. That's great. Okay. Um, Ron asked, with the recording, rather than trying to convey info with my financial planner, would it be possible to provide him with the recording? Um, Ron, I assume that you mean the recording that we have here today, and absolutely yes, and, and, and for everybody on the call, if you want to get a recorded copy of this, uh, you can just email me, scott, S-C-O-T-T, at leavingthebayarea.com, and then we also... It's also my pleasure to speak with your financial advisor directly. I consult with, I'll consult great. with your entire financial team. I'm happy to do that. Awesome. That's great. And another question, we've been talking about selling and buying a new property, but can you also address the possibility of applying 
a reverse mortgage to a property that I now live in and not necessarily need to move? Yes, so that again goes, so again, I can loan about half the home value. So let's say you have a million dollar home, I can loan you approximately $500,000. If you have a mortgage currently, we would need to use the reverse mortgage proceeds to first pay off any existing mortgage. So that would eliminate those monthly mortgage payments for you. So let's say you owe $300,000 in mortgage. So we would use 300 of the 500 to pay off that mortgage. And then you would have about 200 left available from the reverse mortgage that you could access in a line of credit or take a portion of in a lump sum at closing. So it just depends on your age, your home value, how much you owe. And I'm happy, I, I'm, you know, it only takes me a few minutes to run those numbers in my software. So please reach out to me. The easiest way to reach me is 510-REVERSE, 510-R-E-V-E-R-S-E. -E -E. Go straight to my cell phone. How did you get that number? That's I really lucked out. There were two, <laughs> there were two reverse numbers left in the country and 510 happened to be one of them. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so you, you gave your phone number. Why don't you go ahead and give your email address as well? Absolutely. So I'll just put it on the screen real quick. Um, so my email address is akeith, akeith at mutualmortgage.com. Again, I'm with Mutual of Omaha. We've, uh, Mutual of Omaha has been in business about 111, 111 years. We're one of the top reverse mortgage leaders in the country and number one in Heckham for Purchase Loans and licensed in 48 states. So please let me know what your questions are. Okay, this is perfect. Uh, Lisa says, Amanda, I have a referral for you. Lisa, well, you, you are Lisa. awesome. Yeah, thank you. I'm sure she'll gladly accept it. Okay, so if anybody has any last minute questions, let, let's uh, get them out. Any final words, Amanda? We've, we've covered a lot of great information here. I'm hoping it you know, opens people's eyes up to what the possibilities are. And then if it makes sense to have a conversation with you, you certainly can do that on an individual basis, right? Yeah, this is an amazing cash flow tool. I mean, not only can it eliminate your current monthly mortgage payment, but it can, you know, there's so many different ways to use it. I use so many strategies with all uh, different clients come to me with different problems all the time. I can help people in foreclosure or bankruptcy, but my typical client is in the mass affluent category, which means they have a net worth of two to 5 million and they just want to get rid of that mortgage payment, or maybe they didn't buy long-term care insurance and they want to have a safety net um, as to how they can, you know, pay for in-home care costs because about seven out of 10 people need some kind of in-home care at some point in their lives. So if you're thinking about paying all cash for your home, you might think about, might I need that money for something else? Um, this is a great cash flow tool and it's federally insured. And it was nice meeting all of you. I'm gonna put type my uh, email address here into the chat box. I've had a few people ask, how do we access the recording? Um, probably by the end of next week, we'll have the recording available and then I can send a link out to you so you can, again, if you wanna take a look at it again or uh, have anybody who you think might benefit from watching it. So again, it's scott at leavingthebayarea.com. Last question is, where is Amanda located? Amanda, now your office is in San Ramon, but as with a lot of people, are you actually in the office or are you doing virtual? I'm home officing in my house in Oakland, but uh, typically I drive, any, I drive all over the Bay Area to meet my clients when there's no coronavirus. Um, so I'm happy to help anyone anywhere and we can do Zoom calls. I can do everything over FedEx and um, yeah. Let Make it go. easy. You know. And Scott, I want to thank you. You're an amazing resource for people that are relocating. And I know you've got your processes in place and all your resources all over the country. So I, I appreciate knowing you and knowing that you're that resource available for me and my clients. So thank Excellent. You. All right. Well, thanks everybody. This has been wonderful. And uh, Amanda, thank you for your time. I'm, I'm really glad that we got this done and, uh, you know, get some good positive information out there, everybody. So hope everybody has a wonderful weekend and uh, we will see you on a, a future webinar. See you next time. Okay. Bye, bye everybody.